Good morning, and can I welcome everybody to the ninth meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015. Uh, first of all, uh, can I say that we have got apologies from Liam MacArthur and Chick Brodie, and we've got James Dorn in here as substitute for Chick Brodie this morning, so welcome, James. Um, uh, our first item uh, is to consider whether to take item three in private. Are members agreed? Agreed. agreed. Uh, and, of course, I should have said, as I always say, um, we can make sure that electronic devices and phones, etc., are switched off so they don't interfere with the sound system. Our next item is to take evidence on the role of employers as part of our inquiry on attainment. Uh, can I welcome to the committee this morning Graham Barn from the Civil Engineering Contractors Association Scotland, uh, Phil Ford, a Construction Industry Training Board Scotland, Barry McCulloch, Federation of Small Businesses, and Paul Mitchell, the Scottish Building Federation. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, written submissions. Um, uh, very interesting it was. To, but we're going to move straight to questions. Um, and can I start the questioning, if you don't mind, with uh, Mary Scanlon? Yeah, can I just open with a, a question on what skills uh, <coughs> employers are looking for when they're recruiting young people, either straight from school or from college? And, and I'm really looking at the importance of soft skills, as it's often known, uh, and also <coughs> formal qualifications. If you could just give us a brief introduction on that. I think primarily they're looking for uh, employers are looking for young people that have got a good work ethic, that are able to turn up on time, they're able to communicate effectively, they're able to take initiative and to work uh, as a team. I think there has been an issue about some of the, the skills, the technical skills that young people might have before they go on to the apprenticeship, but there are opportunities through skills for work, through work experience opportunities, and there will be more opportunities coming out of the developing uh, Scotland's young workforce in the Wood Commission report um, to better prepare young people for a career in the construction industry. So how would you know if someone came along to you at 16 and interviewed very well? <coughs> how can you tell if that person's got a good work ethic and can work as a team? Is there anything they can bring to the interview in terms of experience or qualifications that would help? Well, you can clearly look at what they've done in school, if they've done a skills for work course, for example, if they've had work experience in the construction industry, um, if they have an interest as well in the construction industry, if they've done the research to find out a little bit about the job that they're applying for. Um, and we would encourage young people actually rather than just sign up straight away for a modern apprenticeship of construction, actually look for work experience opportunities. Take an opportunity to find what it's really like to work in the sector before they make that commitment. And that also reduces the risk from the employer, because obviously the last thing we want is for a young person to start and find that it maybe isn't the career for them. It's better that they test it out beforehand. Okay. Anybody else want to? Yeah, um, I often hear from um, employers really simple basic things like do does the candidate look you in the eye when they shake your hand when they come in to see you are they tenacious uh, the construction industry is one of the, the few remaining industries where you can come in and chat the door and see if they've got an apprenticeship leave your CV come back the next week and try again so um, those are the type of soft skills I think that employers are really looking for um, I, I'm, I'm not sure to what extent employers look for academic qualifications when they're judging a candidate's suitability for an apprenticeship. Okay, can I, can I just ask uh, uh, Paul from uh, the F FSB? Uh, I, I noted, um, I, I thought it was a wee bit of a criticism of teachers in uh, uh, page 10, paragraph 6. What you say is, um, and I quote, undeniably developing the skills and knowledge of teachers in areas they're likely to have little experience in, for example, employability skills and enterprise, is a challenge. Uh, and then you, uh, whether the funding provided by Scottish Government will allow teachers time out of the classroom to create closer links with business remains to be seen. Uh, you seem to be a bit sceptical about the role of teachers in preparing uh, young people uh, for employment, and I just wondered if you would like to uh, expand on that and, you know, to suggest if uh, there's more that could be done um, within schools uh, in preparation. Yeah, um, I think the general point that, that we were making is that the Wood Commission is a challenge both for the education system and for businesses. And up until now, I think it's been fair to say that, that schools and, and colleges haven't been adequately preparing young people for the world of work. And I mean, that is the crux of the Wood Commission. You know, how, do we, how do we better prepare young people for that environment? And um, the point that that particular paragraph was making is that what teachers have been asked to do traditionally has been very focused on qualifications, you know, whether it be hires or now nationals. Um, and now 
in line with the Wood Commission and the government's response to that. They're being asked to build in different competencies, whether it's soft skills, the attitudinal um, behaviours, and that, that in itself is a challenge, and how we get teachers to expose themselves to that different world and get businesses involved at the same time. Um, you know, at the moment, we don't know. It is, it is, a, it is a massive cultural change. Um, but I think we are, we are fairly confident that you know, with the near 30 million that the government's allocated to this, to this agenda, that there will be enough um, time to reflect for the teachers in particular. So are barriers being broken down, or, or you know, what, the silo working being broken down between schools, who, as you say, focus on qualifications, and business is something that you do <coughs> after you leave school and go out the door. You know, what needs to be done to bring them both together? And if I could just also uh, finish on, um, are there any specific skills gaps that you think need to be addressed uh, and opened up? You know. And again, that could be working with schools. You know, we need to have better working with schools to uh, prepare youngsters for the workplace. So, any specific skills gap and be breaking down the barriers between business and schools. Can I just give an example uh, of that and declare an interest here? My wife is a teacher, so I can understand some of the issues that that they have from an employer's perspective. They, they find it difficult to engage with, with schools because they don't quite know how they can go about it. They're never quite certain, are they encouraged into schools uh, or not? And if they are encouraged into schools, do they have to go certain through uh, any checks before they can actually speak to the young people? So I think we need to have a better understanding of how employers can engage with schools. I think employers do wish to engage with schools. I think teachers... Uh, and, and the leaders of schools certainly see there is a role for the schools to work with the local employers, but it's just how we get that together, I think. There, there's just a few barriers we need to overcome so there. Can happen at careers fairs or anything like that? Yeah, I think there's that element. I think we need to get into schools a bit yeah. on a more regular basis than that, however, because a careers fair, construction's in there, we're competing with tourism, yeah. all the other sectors, and what do you get? You get 10, 15 minutes yeah. to make your pitch in a year. Yeah. I think we need a bit more than that to be able to show the, the breadth of careers in construction because sometimes careers people believe that construction is just for a certain type of um, student or pupil, but we offer a breadth of careers um, that degrees at one level down to general operatives at another level. So that's a huge industry with huge potential, with huge requirements of young people. And 10 minutes once a year isn't giving us the opportunity to, to make that case. And maybe bring in more women at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I attended a, a Developing Scotland Young Workforce event on Carnegie, and it was attended by a number of head teachers. And I, I certainly didn't sense that there was any lack of willingness to engage with this. There certainly was a lot of interest around the table. I think there is a greater understanding amongst teachers of the academic roots. And I think it's certainly incumbent in organisations like CITB through our, our network of field-based careers advisors and, and working closely with SDS and other careers advisors to highlight the scale of the opportunities that are available to young people in construction and where career and construction can take them. And we have a, a, a construction ambassador programme where we actually train up people from the industry to go in to speak to kids at primary and secondary school level to talk about their experiences of working in the industry. And that has been quite um, a powerful tool to help teachers, careers advisors and young people understand what a career in construction is like and where a career in construction can take them. Is there still, though, do you, would you accept there's still a problem of, or whether it's a, an, a misunderstanding or something else, um, between um, industry and um, the education sector, and that the education sector, sometimes teachers themselves, don't really understand the difference between construction and engineering and all the different elements, you know, I think that is an issue, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's about working very closely with the education system to outline the scale of opportunities and the career pathways across different sectors. So you start off in one area and you can move on into other areas. So it's actually making that much clearer. Um, and construction is changing. We have off-site manufacture. We have BIM coming through. We've got new technologies. Um, so it's actually giving teachers and the education sector uh, the scale of those opportunities that they can promote to young people. And are they doing it? As I say, we certainly haven't found a lack of willingness to engage with that. I think the levels of awareness 
um, are variable. <laughs> but certainly with the schools that we work with, there is quite a strong level of interest in that. And I think the Wood Commission does provide an opportunity and a framework for schools to engage more in this area. Okay, thank you. Gordon. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a wee bit more about um, employers' responsibility to recruiting young people. Um, the construction industry itself performs fairly well when it comes to apprenticeships. You've got, what, 7% of the total employment and about 10% of the construction apprentices. But, you know, that's still only 1,300 people out of 178,000 people employed in your sector. So, <coughs> bearing in mind that most young people in leaving school will go into either retail, hospitality or tourism, you know, what proportion of that 178,000 people that you employ are actually young people? And, you know, is there a particular problem there? Why you're not recruiting? If you look at the scale of um, construction apprenticeship starting, it's it's around 2,500, which is 10% of the, mm. the total that are coming yeah. through. Um, and there's a very strong employer commitment to taking young people on. If I could just give you one statistic, um, through the recession, over 2,000 young people lost their jobs. And in that same period, 1,800 were replaced with employers. So employers made a, a commitment through recession, through very difficult trading conditions, to take on young people. Uh, and a lot of those employers were small micro-businesses. So there is a strong commitment to taking on apprentices in the construction industry and a strong commitment mm. to training. And in terms of our levy, um, 15 million is, is levied from the construction industry every year in Scotland and 18 million is returned back in the form of training grants. So there is a very strong commitment to training. Yes, certainly more could be done, um, mm. but employers are very much committed to taking on young people. And we've seen that very recently through uh, Muirfield, through that company going into administration. And almost all of those apprentices have now been replaced with other employers. Right. But what's the age profile of the construction industry in general terms? We, we have an ageing aging workforce. That's my point. Um, we have a, a bigger issue um, with people leaving the industry. So on top of the apprentice statistics, our labour market intelligence would tell us that we need 5,700 experienced workers coming back into the industry. And that's because of people who have left the industry through the recession, taking into account inflows and outflows. So that, that is, uh, except a challenge for us going forward. No. Yeah. If, I think, sorry, it's often, mm. it's often quoted that 30% of the construction workforce is 50 years of age or over. Mm. So that gives you an idea of the type of mm. replacement demand that we're going to encounter yeah. in the coming years. Whether that means that that 30% are going to retire remains to be seen. Hopefully yeah. they work on. Um, in terms of apprenticeship recruitment, just to put some context uh, a, a, around that for you, prior to the recession, SBTC, the Scottish Building Apprenticeship and Training Council, were registering 2,700 apprentices each year in construction. Um, that doesn't include uh, plumbers and electricians. Uh, by 2012, that number had dropped to just below 1,300, so mm. more than half in a five-year period. Um, over the last couple of years, we're starting to turn that around and we're facing in the right direction again. Last year, 2014, we registered 1,550 apprentices. So we're growing mm -hmm. again and we'd like to grow towards that 2,700 target um, and beyond. Um, in terms of per capita recruitment, Scotland has always fared better than uh, our counterparts south of the border. There remains in Scottish construction a strong culture to recruit apprentices. Uh, and whilst I think there's room for improvement at the moment, coming out of the recession, the figures are beginning to grow again. Mm -hmm. example on the civil engineering sector is that traditionally you require a degree to be a civil engineer. Mm. Um, and by that time you're 24, never quite certain once you've got your degree whether or not it's actually the industry for you or not. So what we've, we realise is that we have to get to the younger people quicker and we are introducing a foundation apprenticeship where we're going into schools at S4, uh, S5 level and giving those pupils a taste of civil engineering um, and showing them what the career can be there and we're trying to offer them a career pathway where they're employed throughout a period where they go from the foundation apprenticeship, they then go to a modern apprenticeship technician role, again fully employed this when they leave school at see the age 17, 18 and then we can offer a pathway showing two years HND, two years mm. civil engineering degree so what we're trying to demonstrate to a young person is that you can still get to a degree 
um, but you're employed across that whole period. You can jump off at any time in that career path. And also for uh, somebody who has some at university, we can demonstrate that you, you'll get your degree without having the debt at the end of that degree as well. You're employed over that period. So more and more employers realise they have to grow their own. Uh, we're competing out there with all these other industries. The number of young people coming through is, is at a very low period historically at the moment. So we realise we have to be better at showing young people, all young people, not just males, all young people, that there is a career in construction where it's a lifelong career, it's not a hire and fire industry. So on that basis, you're saying you have to grow your own. Are you supportive of the Skills for Work initiative that's taking place in schools? And at the Absolutely, moment? yes. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay you, you finished there, sorry? I've got another couple of questions, but oh. Mary wants to come in. Mary's summer. got a quick supplementary, yeah. I think. It was a very quick uh, supplementary. My son is a civil engineer, so I know uh, what it takes to get through that pathway. Are you saying that the foundation apprenticeship, the modern apprenticeship, is 17, and then you go on and do uh, an HND at college, you can do it distance learning or, or whatever, uh, as an ex-lecturer. Do you see an HND as equivalent to a degree, or did you say after the two years at HND, they would then have to go and do a two-year Degree. So, the, so is there clear articulation from HND into into a degree course? But those two years would be full time at university. The final two years. Yes, you're employed at that period, but day release along that period. Yes. Oh, day release to university yes. to do a degree. Yes, that two year period. So that for the is final two years for junior and years. senior honours. Yes. So we're working with. You can do that by day release. We're doing that with colleges just now. Inverness College has got is up and running and doing yeah. that with I think it's Strathclyde University on the civil engineering degree. And that's engineers who are employed and doing one day yes. day release, yes. and they come out with a, an honours degree in civil, degree engineering. in civil engineering. Yes. Attending college one day a week. I'm not sure it was one day a week. I'd have to come back to you on that. But yes, that's how it's working. It's two years. But they're employed in that period, so they're working with their employer yes. and also getting block release. It would be to go down to university to complete that course. Block release? Block release, yes. I, I'd be interested in more information on I'll the articulation convener at uh, yeah. a later date. Yes, I can Thank do that. Yes. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Sorry, Gordon. Right. Thanks very much, convener. Um, my question for the FSB is... You know, we heard evidence, or we've gained, uh, gathered evidence that say many small and micro businesses find it difficult to employ an apprentice. They lack the capacity to provide the resources and training needed. You know, what are the, what are the difficulties? Can you expand on them? Yeah, sure. um, I think it's fair to say that, you know, in contrast to, to the construction industry, modern apprenticeships is, is, tend to not be the, the training that smaller businesses prefer. Um, the statistics that we have say that about 8% of our members will recruit a modern apprenticeship. Um, that figure has been under about 11 12% for five <laughs> to six years, so there's a steady pattern of disengagement. Now, when we ask our members about why that is, what tends to come back to us is that the model itself isn't flexible enough. Um, so the, the example that we get quite often is, you know, I, I build camper vans in East Lothian, and when they go to day release in college, they come back and they don't add value. Um, so that, that's one particular issue. But the other two key issues is time and cost pressures. You know, you have 98% of all businesses in Scotland are small. 94% mm -hmm. um, are under 10 employees or less. Mm -hmm. And you know, many do not have a formal HR setup. So how they approach recruitment and engagement, it tends to be quite risk averse. Mm -hmm. And when you undertake a modern apprenticeship, there is a commitment that you make. Um, and in the past, I think it's it's accurate to say that you know that um, that willingness to engage in a formal programme of training um, has has not been taken up. You know, our members tend to prefer informal work-based training that they can dip in and out. That's much more bite-sized um, rather than you know the the commitment that they make for an apprenticeship. Um, but you know, overall, I think it's the broad point that, that we would make is that it's very difficult to generalise, and it depends on the sector. You know, it depends on the size of the business, the scale, the geography. You know, mm. having apprenticeships in rural areas have their own challenges, mm. um, whether that be you know distance to market, distance to education institution for day release. Mm. Well, the, the one the one difficulty I have with, with that point you've just raised about 
you know, it's small businesses and they don't have HR departments, etc. How many hairdressing firms have uh, HR departments? I mean, hairdressing has 900 apprentices and they're predominantly small businesses with uh, half a dozen employees. You know, how does that small business manage to take on apprentices straight from school and train them and yet other businesses that are of a similar size and scale don't? I think it, it harks back to the previous point about complexity and that in hairdressing, for example, Modern Apprenticeships is an established training programme. Um, so it's part of that culture of business, whereas in other service sectors, um, whether it be retail, tourism, hospitality, it's less so. Um, so it really comes back to what, what is common amongst the businesses within that sector um, and what is the expectation either from the business owner or the relationship with the college or the public sector. But if we're going to get people that have got the right level of skills and experience for small businesses to take on, how do we do that? Whose responsibility is you know, to get people that are, are work ready and ready for these small businesses? Whose <coughs> responsibility is to do that? I think it, fundamentally that's the business's responsibility. Yeah. You know, they, they make that skills assessment. They, they know their business. Mm -hmm. um, is there a route for the public sector to assist them in that assessment? Uh, absolutely, you know that that is what Skills Development Scotland are there to do. Um, but um, we, we are of the opinion that now the modern apprenticeship programme is only applicable to certain businesses in certain sectors, and we need to start talking about how s other businesses can access skills and training in a mm -hmm. flexible way. Mm -hmm. So, h how much engagement do you have? with colleges on that issue or with schools in particular to encourage them to, to work for your members? The Wood Commission is is a bit of a game changer. I think it's it's absolutely fair to say. Um, and the, in the past, businesses have been fairly passive and now we're getting to a point where businesses are having to be much more involved. They're ha having to be partners in that process. It's too early to say whether or not that, that <coughs> cultural change can actually be achieved, um, whether schools are open and, and colleges, um, or whether the businesses are willing or, or able to engage. But we are only a few months into mm. the Scottish Government strategy, and it, I think it is too early to say. Um, but I think we are, we are optimistic that now about one in four of our members want to get engaged. It's just how they get engaged. It's right. the tangibility of that engagement. So when they speak to schools and colleges or they've had that outreach, it's been very specific of what you want from that business. You know, how can they help? Rather than come and engage in our schools, it's can you provide classroom visits? Can you provide careers advice, entrepreneurship, mm. mentoring? It's been very specific around what that type of engagement and the time requirements that would be mm. that would be necessary. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, thank you, um, George. The question is around attainment and the inequalities in attainment. Now, one of the situations that uh, the evidence has given us is the fact that we've got a, there seems to be a problem in schools when it comes to, and with parents, when it comes to the idea of uh, vocational and academic. It seems to be everything seems to be weighed down in the academic side of things. Now, we're constantly getting told we're not getting people that are going into vocational uh, the side uh, of business now. And in times, I've heard uh, stories of young people being encouraged to go academic when they could have quite easily gone down the engineering route or something like that. So how do we get, we've talked about it a wee bit today, but how do we get to the stage where we can, uh, we actually manage to change that culture within schools uh, to try and move it towards, a, there's a, a parity similar to the European models where there is a parity there's not looked down upon to go down the vocational route in school? I think some of that is raising uh, the scale of the opportunities available to young people and to the teachers. Um, there is a bit of a challenge. Some schools will measure the success in terms of the number of people that go on to university. And I think you know, we need to challenge that and promote careers and vocational careers is just as equally valid. And I think through the, uh, the Wood Commission, there is an opportunity through these new foundation modern apprenticeships and also through the senior phase at school where young people actually get an opportunity to try out different careers. So they're not having to get right through to the end of their career, uh, at the end of their school uh, time, and then make a decision about what um, apprenticeship they want to go on to. They've actually a chance to sample something through work experience, through an FMA, uh, through some other initiative, which enables them to make a decision about what they actually want to do. Um, but there's still quite a bit of work to be done in this area. It's still a challenge.
One of the other things that uh, tends to be coming up is it's down to leadership within the local uh, local schools as well, when it comes to either head teacher or everybody embracing it. But I was quite interested. We went to uh, Wester Hales Education Centre, and uh, they seem to have not a bad balance of working with the local college and also working uh, with uh, the vocational side, but it's adding a bit of flexibility that a lot, a lot of other schools uh, are looking at. But one of the other things I wanted to ask is, where do you see the relevance of employers in attainment and, a re and reducing the attainment gap? I use this, I'm asking this question because perfect example is my own father. Uh, about in the 1960s, came out of junior secondary school uh, after failing his 11 plus, ended up uh, getting an apprenticeship in a local business and uh, then ended up employing uh, over 200 people in his own town himself. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we do that? How do we do that nowadays? Because uh, these opportunities aren't there when you come out of school for uh, young people. How do we make sure that we can uh, make sure that the curriculum's there and it's part of the curriculum? Well, certainly from the employer perspective, one of the things that's been introduced recently is the investors in young people accolade, and that's something that uh, employers can work towards, and we've got examples of a number of construction companies that have already got that award, and if I just use one example, um, GMG Contractors in East End of Glasgow, uh, run, run by Jerry McGinn, um, who um, he's actually helped a lot of young people who've had quite a hard start in life. Um, got honours and apprenticeships with his company, uh, and, and many of them have stayed. There's a very low churn rate there. He's, he's invested the time to actually support and help them and bring them through. And there's many more examples like that right across the construction industry in Scotland. I think as an industry, um, we need to inspire young people to, to make a choice to look at construction industry across the breadth of careers that's available to them. And going back to one of the points that Phil made of the, the young ambassadors that we have, so there's no point old bloke like me going into school. I'm, I'm not something they're going to look to, but what we've got to get is the young people in the industry to go back and show, look, look what I've achieved. Uh, and across the breadth of all the different qualifications and careers that we have, so we've got to inspire young people to actually make the choice to say, you know what, I, I want to have a look at what construction can offer me. And we've then got to make sure that the school's in a position to work with employers to be able to offer these young people tasters, work experience, somewhere along the line, so they can then say, yeah, this is for me, or actually, no, this is not for me at all. Rather than have them sitting third and fourth year not really sure what they want to do until they leave school and then they make a, a career decision that might not be the right one. We need to get in a bit earlier mm -hmm. and give them that taster of, of what, what is available to them. I liked what you said earlier, Graham, about giving them the whole kind of uh, career path. I think that's obviously the yeah. vision thing, because one of the things you'll be aware that my own constituency in Paisley, uh, the UWS was traditionally a, a technical college and uh, their big thing in the engineering side was effectively they had to tell the parents <coughs> and the kids how much that child could earn within that industry to recruit them into that. And it was only then that uh, everybody started to mm -hmm. work out what the future was. Can I ask from the entrepreneurial side, like small businesses, you know, how we traditionally in Scotland, uh, regardless of background, uh, traditionally, we don't seem to have this entrepreneurial spirit of people wanting to be self-employed or seeing it as an option. It's always get a job or uh, do something else. Uh, how, how do we get that kind of spirit into the young people and regardless of uh, their own social economic background? Certainly, there's, I think there's much more we can do, but I think it's worth reflecting on the fact that since 2008, one of the the upside so of the downturn was this massive explosion in self-employment. Um, you know, we had a 30% growth. Um, there was, whether through distress or otherwise, people <coughs> starting their own business and taking that leap. And there are organisations like Young, Young, Young Enterprise Scotland or the Prince's Trust who do good work. The problem is it's very patchy and it's very reliant on the relationship that they have either with the school or the education provider or with the education authority, and you know there they are so back to leadership at educational. With the authority I think it's and it's about leadership, but it's also about recognising that you know building in that spirit of entrepreneurship within education has other implications and other positive consequences for young people. Whether it's building confidence, whether it's engaging with young people in a different way, you know the the Wood Commission were right to point out that you know around fifty percent 
of those who do not go down the academic route um, are twice more likely to be unemployed. You know, it's, it's how you engage them and make sure that they can make that contribution, make sure that they're prepared for life in the jobs market because it will be incredibly tough for them. Uh, first of all, in the, the, the Scottish construction sector, around about a quarter of all uh, workers engaged are self-employed, so there's still a, a, a strong element of self-employment in Scottish construction. Whether that's real self-employment or phony self-employment, whether that's good or bad, it remains um, a feature of the Scottish construction sector. Another feature um, within Scottish construction is for uh, candidates who started out on an apprenticeship to actually end up being the owner of their own company. Um, and you said, where's that entrepreneurial spirit? I can think of many um, candidates who started out on an apprenticeship and have ended up running their own company, be that a small local company or a, a, a national company. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Robertson at Robertson Construction Springs to mind started out in a joining apprenticeship and now employs hundreds of people in the construction industry. And I think that's one of the reasons why we still retain this strong culture of apprenticeship recruitment. And it maybe touches a point on, on the point that was raised earlier, why the hairdressers still recruit so many apprentices. Well, part of the answer for that to me is because many of the hairdressers who now run businesses would have one day previously been the, the apprentice hairdresser themselves. Uh, and that, that's an element we still retain in, in Scottish construction. To come back to, to your earlier point about the involvement in, uh, of employers in raising attainment, for me, there are three elements there. First of all, uh, careers advice, information and guidance that Graham touched upon earlier. We've got to get into schools uh, as early as possible to start that engagement process. Um, the careers advice, advice has got to be more modern. It's got to be more interactive. As Graham says, there's no point in people like us going in and doing a PowerPoint presentation on construction. We've got to get the kids' hands dirty. We've got to get them involved in mock construction exercises, etc. Uh, I think the, the second thing that uh, employers can offer is better work experience placements. Uh, when I was at school, we got one week's work experience in fourth year. I'm really not sure how meaningful or beneficial that actually is. That's, that's got to be uh, a far more uh, meaningful way of doing that. And the third element for me is employers have got to get involved in shaping the vocational qualifications that are offered <coughs> at school level. We can't just expect it to happen by magic. Employers have got to get in. Uh, to, to organisations like the SQA and describe, explain, outline exactly what it is they want in terms of vocational edu education at schools. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Mark. Yeah, thanks, I've touched on attainment and I think there's been discussions on how you improve attainment um, more generally, but I just wanted to ask um, if members of the panel see the attainment gap and the difference in attainment in their most affluent and most deprived communities um, as an issue for your members? And how that's how that's impacting on the businesses as well. I mean, are you are you able to, to see um, a, a big enough pool of candidates for a for the post that you're advertising? Are there particular pockets of the country where that's a, a bigger issue than others? Look at apprentice recruitment. There is actually quite a healthy um, supply of applicants for each apprenticeship place. Um, it's about four applicants for each modern apprenticeship position in construction. So there's clearly a lot of interest out there. Um, but some parts of the country, for example, Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire, where you're competing with the oil and gas sector, it can be a little bit more challenging to get young people in. So we do quite a, a strong piece of work there with the schools to try and promote the construction careers. Um, give them information about the wages they'll be earning and the career potential to try and get them to consider a career in construction. Um, so it does vary across across the country. I think um, what I would say, the industry, certainly the civil engineering side of it, up to 18 months, two years ago, the main concern of the sector was workload. Just get us work, please get us work. Um, it was a big switch about 18 months, two years ago, now the main priority is skills and development. It's a case of where are the people to do the work that we've now got. So employers have kind of woken up to that. A bit late, you might say, but they've woken up to the fact is we really need young people, people from all parts of society. So the attainment gap, there's a job for everybody in the construction industry. 
So what we're doing as a sector is that we realise that we need to try and get a supply chain down through into primary schools. So we're funding at the Civil Engineering Contractors Association are funding a project called Bridges to Schools where the uh, institutional civil engineers uh, have a bridge. This is not just a wee silly wee bridge, it's a, a seven metre bridge which goes in and it runs with primary six and primary seven um, school kids for two days and what they then do is they work together as a team they work out the difficulties and they assemble this huge bridge and they walk across it. So what we're trying to do is get into primary schools, showing young people, look, this is what construction is about. The bridges to schools thing is, is great because we're actually building a very, very big bridge <laughs> just not far from here. And so the whole idea is once we've done that, we then take them to the education centre at South Queen's Ferry so they can show them the real bridge getting built, you've built your bridge, here's another bridge getting built, and to try and get them early, to get them encouraged, enthused about it. And we've got some iconic buildings in Scotland. We've got to be better at using that to say, look, the built environment is for everyone. Let's make our society better through building and try and sell it. And then later on, what we then do is show them, actually, it's a lifelong career, and you can actually make some decent money in construction. I think what's not well understood is actually construction pays well. I think a lot of people view construction as being a low-paying industry. No, it's not. It, it pays well. So we can show that, but employers have a great role, a far greater role than they've had in the past, to sell the industry. Because if we don't, then we've got big problems. Can I ask about that particular programme? And you talk talk about and the issue of the industry being the the flow of people who you're, you're going to need um, to fill those roles. Mm. The, the most fruitful areas to me would seem to be the areas of highest unemployment and highest availability of um, people to come into those mm. roles. Is there a particular focus on areas of higher unemployment, higher deprivation when you're talking about that? Um, yeah, bridges to, bridges schools, to schools, or is that just that broadly what, across what all areas? What we're trying areas, to do... Just, uh, just I mean, my, my point in this question is, is about reducing the gap, the attainment gap, yeah. rather than a yeah. broad increase in educational attainment and employment across the whole of Scotland. We've got a grand plan there. Whether this grand plan will ever work is, is another thing. But we were running these foundation civil engineering apprenticeships, which is a partnership between a secondary school and a college, so we're running two pilots. We're running a pilot in West Lothian, which involves West Lothian College, uh, Carluc High School, and some West Lothian high schools. We're taking the bridges to schools into the feeder primary schools for that secondary school. So if you've got Carluc High School, it will have feeder primary schools into that. We're taking the bridge to schools project in there because there is a route, as we see it, from primary school, secondary school, vocational um, foundation apprenticeship and then to the local college. So that's what we're trying to do. Similarly, we're trying to do the same up in Inverness with Inverness College and its two uh, secondary schools up there too. So that's what we're trying to do. It's at very early days yet, but in those primary schools, those with will have difficulty in attainment and hopefully we can show them that there's a role for them in there as well too. If I could just make a point as well, we work very closely with the Department for Work and Pensions. We've just signed a strategic agreement with them, which covers a number of areas. And one of the things we're looking to do um, is share labour market intelligence on a regional basis so we know where the skill shortages are and we can then um, prioritise those. We, we look at a long-term five-year forecast uh, so we know where the skills are going to be. We can then work with the DWP if they've got people on their books who could fill those immediate skills gaps. We can also work with the schools to promote the careers in an area where we know those skills are going to be required. Um, and uh, we can then offer sessions for their own advisors so that they're aware of the opportunities that are available in the construction industry and bring the employers uh, to, to them. And that, so far, that's working fairly successfully. Um, and we've also asked uh, every construction employer through Apprenticeship Week to make a pledge to take young people on for work experience opportunity with a view, hopefully, to have them moving on to either an MA or paid employment at the end. 
Yeah, yeah, just building on previous comments, I think it's worth reflecting on three points. Private sector employment in Scotland has, is at the highest level it's been since 1999, over two million jobs. You know, in, in a time when public sector employment has gone down. Um, you know, the second point is that there is an untold story about the role of small businesses in taking those furthest from the labour market. Depending on what statistics you, you read about across the UK, it's somewhere between 75% and 90% of those who are, who are either inactive or unemployed find employment in small businesses. Um, you know, they just don't have the CSR or marketing departments to tell people about it. Um, the third point is you know, directly addressing the issue of skill shortages. You know, I think it's, it's definitely the case that we haven't yet matched supply and demand. And, you know, if, we, if we did, there would be no unemployment. Um, but part of the answer to that is more local and robust labour market intelligence. So whether if you're in a school or a college, how do you match what you offer in your curriculum to what the labour market can absorb, either within the short term or the medium term? You know, until we get to the point where our curriculum is both influenced by the private sector and um, producing for the private sector, you always have these dislocations between you know, the supply of the skills and the demand from industry. Okay, can I just raise one point? Um, Graham, you mentioned it twice now about the um, foundation apprenticeships um, in a relatively positive way, um, and yet the uh, Scottish Building Federation in the written submission uh, said um, a significant level of concern remains regarding proposals to create foundation apprenticeships in craft occupations. And you go on to list practical issues, training issues, and progression issues, Paul, within your. Um, I just wondered, you know, it's come up a couple of times, Graham seemed to be. I don't want to put words in your mouth, Graham, but you were, seemed to be reasonably positive about uh, foundation apprenticeships, but the written evidence from the SPF is very different. Sure. Um, I, I think, first of all, we stand by the evidence that's in, in the written uh, statement there that there are a number of concerns in the construction industry regarding foundation apprenticeships. And perhaps we could come to those in, in more detail in just a second. I should say I've, I, I have had some exposure to the programme that Graham's uh, operating. I think it's excellent, and so far today it has been successful. But it is aimed mainly at more academic, perhaps blue collar type uh, occupations, technicians, uh, rather than uh, rather than uh, guys that are going to end up on the tools or uh, operatives that are going to end up on the tools. If we want to come to have a look at uh, foundation apprenticeships themselves, uh, I've lifted, listed some uh, issues in the, the written evidence there that, uh, that outline our concerns. They're, they're broadly uh, shaped into, into three categories. The practical issues around timetabling, uh, around resources principally for me, um, looking to get more vocational training into schools isn't necessarily a new idea. The, the main reason why it hasn't happened in the past is because it's resource intensive. You need low uh, pupil to instructor ratios, you need materials, you need a lot of space, you often need transport to get to colleges. Uh, it's often a, a, an expensive route to, to look at. And there are academic alternatives which are, are maybe not quite so expensive. So that's one of the main reasons why vocational training hasn't really got off the ground in schools to date. Um, I go on to, to look at the training issues and candidates wouldn't have that daily experience of being uh, involved in the construction industry. So at the moment, embedded within the, the apprenticeship framework is the opportunity to go to college for a couple of weeks, come back to site, practice your skills on site, go to college again, practice again on site. And there's a, 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 an interrelationship there between on-site and off-site training. Uh, progression issues, where does the candidate go if they don't manage to get an apprenticeship at the end uh, of their school term? If they undertake a foundation apprenticeship and start to work towards uh, some of their SVQ, where's the progression route after they, they finish school? We're not, we're not quite sure on that point just yet. But most importantly, um, I think at the end of the paper, we outline a positive alternative to the foundation apprenticeship, which is skills for work and the National Progression Award, the NPA in construction, which offer candidates, first of all, employability skills, <coughs> but secondly, they offer a taster of a variety of different occupations within the construction sector, and that opportunity for candidates to make more 
informed career decisions is, is very, very very beneficial at that stage in their development. Okay, thank you. I'm, not going to, I'm, I'm keen to explore that, but I know there's some, some members of questions directly on, about, on sure. apprenticeships, so we'll come to that um, later. But that's thank, very helpful for, for you to outline that. Thank you very much. Um, our next, I've got Colin. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Vera. Um, I'd like to go back to engagement between employers and employer organisations and the schools. Looking at the submissions that have come in, there's a lot of aspirational stuff here, but I don't see too firm uh, a design, a plan, a way forward in terms of developing these relationships. What do you think? What do you think of the current levels of engagement between employers, employers' organisations, and schools? Is it is it good? Is it uh, variable? How do you see it? Some really good examples of, of good practice out there. I, I mentioned earlier the Construction Ambassador Programme, which we have, where we invite people from the industry to go through a one-day course to enable them to go into schools at primary and secondary level and talk about their experiences of working in the construction industry. And generally speaking, schools are very receptive to that. They're happy to have people come in. Um, so there is uh, quite a strong link between um, schools and, and uh, colleges and employers. How could that be stronger? Yes, I'm sure it could, and I'm sure in some areas it, it could be improved. But I think there's certainly a strong willingness from employers because they can see the benefits of the apprenticeship system, particularly those who've engaged in it for a number of years. They can see the benefits of engaging with, with the schools and the colleges and getting good calibre young people in as apprentices. And, and most of these small businesses that take on apprentices will keep the apprentice after they finish their training because they want to mould them into the shape of their particular company. So, yes, more could be done, but there are some good practice out there. What actual measures are being taken by... Again, I'll say employers and employers' organisations, uh, because obviously they would have a slightly different approach. Um, what measures are actually being taken to increase the engagement? Can I, sorry, can I give an example of, of that? Is that we as an, organi an employers' organisation run what we call a training and development forum twice a year, and this is where the, the people within companies come together and we talk about our training and development issues. Um, what we've done recently is invite along schools, heads of schools and local colleges to these meetings. And we had one about three weeks ago where we had uh, West Lothian College and the head teacher from Carluke High School gave up their time and came along. And that was very enlightening, I think, for both parties because... It was a forum, so employers were able to ask the question of the head teacher of a school, which is the leader of that particular school, what his views were. And I think he got a better understanding of where employers were coming from. So early days yet, but we're hoping every time we do one of these ones, we'll invite along in the same basis head teachers, local colleges, to see how do we work together. We're all trying to achieve the best thing for our young people. They're trying to get the best for their young people at school, we're trying to get the best for our, our industry and the best people into our industry. So we need that needs to be working better. So that's a small step, but I think if we keep working that way, that we get a better understanding of what each other's requirements are and the difficulties we have. I think employers feel that schools are a no-go area for us. We have to be invited in. Uh, we're not able to... We have to work to a, a set school timetable. I think the head teacher said that's not actually the case, and our employers weren't aware of that. So I think it's just hearing it from both sides and working out, yeah, there is actually ways we can do this. We, we also have um, 15 industry training groups within Scotland, which are made up of groups of employers in regions all the way from Dumfriesite to the Western Isles up to Orkney and Shetland. And every year, those groups will have targets for schools engagement, and a lot, number of the members of those groups will be actively involved in engaging with the local schools. We have Apprenticeship Week coming up in May, um, and working with, with SDS and, and bodies like SICA and the Scottish Building Federation and others, there are 40 events planned the length and breadth of Scotland, and a lot of those will involve engagement with schools and young people. So it's building on um, activities <coughs> and, and events like this to, to you know, reach the objectives we want to get to in terms of the level of engagement between schools and employers. In previous evidence sessions, we've heard from various bodies that the schools don't seem to be putting together the mix of skills that employers are necessarily looking for. And obviously that's why engagement is so important. 
Do you find that that is the case? Um, I think there's probably a bit more work to be done to, to link in the, the construction offer into the curriculum for excellence, and that's one of the things that we'll be doing this year in terms of actually mapping it. Um, I think there is a willingness of uh, schools to engage with the process, but certainly a little bit more work can be done uh, in that area. And I think it's, uh, it's also making the, the schools aware of the, the opportunities that are available in construction and the career pathways that we talked about earlier. Yeah, the, the, no, sorry. No, please. Sure. Um, the, the point that, that I would make is that, in actual fact, we, we don't know that much about small businesses' engagement and the education system. In fact, we know, we know very little. Um, the, the only statistics available in Scotland were from a survey we commissioned a, a couple of years ago. And that found that basically you can split small businesses 50-50 between those who engage and those who don't. Um, of those who do engage, the top three types of experience tend to be things like work experience, classroom visits, class talks. Um, but more importantly for those who don't engage, some of the key issues are um, things like they haven't been contacted, so there's this level of passivity to an extent. Um, you know, it hasn't been considered the cost time pressures, but encouragingly what, what we found is that you know, there is about 25% of small businesses in Scotland who are willing to get in, involved, and it's just how you broker that relationship. We're hopeful that they invest in young people groups that have come on stream from the, the Wood Commission and the government's response to that will do that. You know, their role is to build that bridge between the business world and education in a very practical way. You know, how do you get involved in holding their hand through the whole process? Because the process for small businesses is very important. You know, it, it's, it's really critical to get it right so that it doesn't take too much time, um, so that it's not onerous, that it's reflective of their needs. Um, so yes, we, we're very confident that will take place. In your opinion, and given your experience, what is the biggest change schools could make that would support businesses? If I had to pick one, it would be positive outreach. It would, it would be a message to the business community that we are open. You know, I think the point that Graham made is a very good one. Um, a lot of businesses expect that engagement to come from schools, whether, whether we like it or not. You know, I think if they were to work with other parts of the public sector, particularly the enterprise network, whether it's Business Gateway, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, there is an intelligence that we have in Scotland and how we can <coughs> utilise that to make sure that businesses get more involved I think could be a bit of a game changer because if you look at the experience in, in Northern European countries, the bit where you have a model where businesses are much more involved, youth unemployment goes down. Um, you know, in, in Switzerland, for example, 88,000 88, foundational modern apprenticeships are delivered per year. Um, you know, they are quite staggering stats, which is why Skills Development Scotland are so keen um, to build that model, notwithstanding the concerns that Paul, Paul raised. So, given, given that, that particular point you've made there, do you believe that it is primarily the responsibility of the schools to reach out to the employers? I, real, I realise you know, that, that it's a judgement here, but do you believe that the schools should be the ones to reach out to the employers simply? In some cases, yes. I think there, there is increasingly a shared responsibility. Um, but you know, f from our perspective, the, the role of schools in particular is to pair, prepare young people for the workplace. There is a philosophical debate about what the role of schools is, but fundamentally, that, that's our opinion. So the, how they engage and make sure that those young people are ready for the workplace is important. That's as important as the qualifications that they produce, and that's what's most important for, for our members. It's less about you know, the abstract qualifications and how they apply that learning in the workplace, which makes work experience and work placement so important. Uh, to add to that, I think employers can help uh, schools, and help guidance teachers when they're guiding young people um, as to what they're exactly looking for. I mean, uh, young kids are young kids. Uh, 16 year olds coming out for a job interview, they're not going to have a huge CV. They're just not, because they're only 16. And they're a bit immature, a bit shy. And employers realise that, but we need to be better at telling guidance teachers just a couple of wee couple of things that these kids could do better. And perhaps, you know, the personal statements they bring in, rather than a CV, a personal statement, what's their interest, what do they get involved in? That's the type of thing an employer uses when he's making a decision on employing somebody, it, they just don't have a CV. And it's not all, all about academic achievement. It's what they do out of school, 
what how how they socially engage in many cases. So sometimes I think schools just kind of well, it's it's a kind of wee form of CV, and they don't spend enough time in helping the kids to understand. It's not a formal job interview. It's a it's a chat that they're having with an employer, and an employer realises if they can get you know three or four decent coherent points out of it, that's as much as they could expect really, and then they make their decisions on that. And I think it's a mixture of both. You know, it's the schools reaching out. It's also the employers reaching out. Um, and there's some great examples of good practice. It's capturing what works well. I don't think there's a, a lack of willingness for our schools to engage, but there might be a lack of understanding and knowledge about how best to engage and the opportunities that are out there and how what has been offered by the employer links into the curriculum for excellence. And I think just joining all that up um, would be a very positive way forward. And I think the invest in youth groups is one way of doing that. OK, thank you. Um, Siobhan. Thank you. Um, We've covered a lot this morning about engagement with schools, but I'm wondering what the barriers are to employers and engagement with individual pupils. What would be the barriers there? In terms of offering work placements, often uh, employers uh, say to us that there's barriers in terms of health and safety. Uh, there's perceived health and safety barriers. They're not only to operate certain machinery uh, until they're 18 years of age. Many employers like... Uh, People who are going to go onto the building sites to have a certain level of health and safety training, perhaps possess a, a, a safety card before they come on site. Uh, I'm not sure how uh, real some of those uh, concerns actually are. I think when you begin to break them down, we can we can overcome them, but there's certainly a widespread perception uh, and a hesitance amongst employers in the construction industry to have 15, 16-year-old kids on, on their building sites. <laughs> wants is for a school pupil to come out and have an accident on site um, so there is there is a concern but it's actually working with the employer to identify what are the real barriers okay they may not be able to work in a particular piece of equipment but there is something they can do and it's not just making tea and coffee in the office you can health and safety training there's bits and pieces they can do where they're shadowing they're out accompanied on site watching what's happening there and it's it's just sort of outlining what is possible um, and once we break down some of those barriers, and again, we've got some great examples of employers who have engaged and overcome those, working with them very closely, um, it, it works well. So it's just unpacking that a little bit to split the real from the perceived barriers. I mean, the reason I ask that question is, and it goes back to Mark's point about the attainment gap, a lot of the evidence that we've heard this morning, very useful as it is, is all about what we can do with the Wood Commission and, and the responsibilities there. It doesn't address the problem of the attainment gap of how, when you go into a school, the teachers have already selected the, the pupils that they think are the best for your industry or are the more apt to have a discussion with you or are better at presentations or whatever that may be. We might be missing the real pupils who would adapt better to situations. And so therefore, the question that I was asking um, was trying to get to the point where employers have to look for those pupils in the schools because from where I sit, that's already the barrier to you, that you've already got the pre-selected pupils for you. How then do we get into that gap? I mean, we're trying to come up with evidence um, for a report that suggests we can do something practical in this gap. It's it's all very well and good to the Commission, we're all signed up to it, um, about the practical measures that we can get to and the opportunities we can give pupils. But if you're not getting to the pupils who can get those opportunities, mm. we're failing them already. I think there's a lot about getting in there at an early enough point so you're not, as you say, being given pre-selected candidates that have been shepherded in a particular direction. But there's, it's, quite, it's quite a complex area, this. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's not just the relationship with the pupils. There's the parents, there's the careers advisors, there's the teachers. And getting in um, at a very early point, so not towards the end of a career in school, actually at an earlier point, S1 to S3, or even at primary school level, to offer the opportunities in, in construction at that, at that level. Um, so... I think you know there's, there's a great deal of work to be done with parents because they probably have the greatest influence over what young people do or don't do. And, and speaking certainly to some of our apprentices in the college last week, um, if their dad has left school at 16, they're probably going to be quite encouraging of them going in. If they haven't done, then less encouraging. So it's actually trying to uh, work with the parents through the, the parent forum and also linking in through uh, My World of Work, for example, SDS's website that's been refreshed uh, for, for young people and through our own careers portal 
to help uh, parents and careers advisors and teachers understand what opportunities are available and not necessarily push young people down a route which is not suitable for them. So I think it's early intervention and it's um, outlining the scale of the opportunity as an early stage as possible. Okay, and just finally, in, in your evidence this morning, um, or, or the written, no one spoke about protected characteristics and the work that you're doing in that. So, for instance, the problem of not getting enough females into the sector, not getting enough people from an ethnic uh, minority background, not getting anyone with disabilities. Th that didn't come up in evidence, and clearly that's part of the attainment gap. So what practical measures have been done to, to address that? And, and how do you promote it? Because clearly you don't promote it in work that you give to us. Um, so it's all hidden away um, and instead of being out uh, in the open. Um, well, one of the projects under the, the Joint Investment Strategy in the CITB um, submission talks about on-site, which is a piece of work we're doing with um, Equate at Napier University, and that's specifically to address gender issues within the construction industry. So it's work experience opportunities but it's actually focusing on um, schoolgirls that want to come into the construction industry, but providing some additional support and help. So what are the opportunities that are available? Um, what uh, are the career opportunities? What are the barriers that they might have to overcome, real and perceived? Um, what support can they get around childcare costs, particularly at seven in the morning when you're going onto a construction site? So Equate have worked very hard with us to identify some of those barriers and carried out a great deal of research into some of the, the areas. Um, and that's been captured as a theme within the new um, skills investment plan for the construction industry um, that we've we fed into and the SDS launched um, a couple of weeks back. Um, we have had conversations with organisations like Stonewall around sexuality. Um, so it is a very real issue. We're very aware of it. We know that we have only around 2% female in the craft modern apprenticeships, although it's slightly higher at 30% in the professions. And we're working very hard to, to address that. But we have some great examples of women who've come into the construction industry and now doing very well for themselves running their own business. And we have a number of female construction ambassadors that go into the schools and promote very strongly their experiences of working in the sector. So um, I, I wouldn't like the committee to, to feel that we're not addressing this. We are very much looking at, 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 the, at these areas. Can I give you a practical example of, of what we're trying to do on the foundation apprenticeship I keep talking about on the civil engineering? Um, the, the college has stated that it's going to be a 50-50 split between young boys and young girls. And when they recruit the boys, because they'll probably get more than the girls applying for it, they will stop at 50% and they will actively then try and fill the remaining places with girls. So small step, I, I accept, small step, but it is an example of how we're, we're, we realise that we can't keep avoiding half of the, the workforce out there. Just to be devil's advocate for a moment, Graham, if you're a parent of a, a, a young boy who's at school who's applying for the very course you've just described and who's very able and very keen, um, and unfortunately for them, they're number 51 in the percent of that perfectly able and skilled individual, and you're saying, we won't take you, but there are lots of empty spaces, but we're going to try and find other people to fill them because you're not getting that space. How do you think they would feel about that? As a parent, I don't think I'd be best pleased by that, I have to <coughs> say. I think then the pressure would go back on to the, the college and to try and increase the number of spaces proportionately. So you take on all the young boys, but you make sure that you have the balance and get the girls coming through. Because with the foundation apprenticeship, it's employer backed. So there's employers out there who will, who have signed up to and will give work experience to these young people in the second year of that foundation apprenticeship. And employers realise they're not just after boys, they're after young women too. So we know what we've got to do, but as a parent, yes, I would be a bit miffed. But you've got I've to take the bigger... I've suggested bigger. Be, I suggest a bit miffed doesn't really... <laughs> but I, as an industry, we've got to take a bigger picture on that. We've just got to say, look, that's... Now, the, the, point I'm, the reason I'm raising it, Graeme, is, isn't it that the problem is, is actually right back at the core of the, the start of this, about actually um, encouraging young girls to actually apply for these in the first place? You know, I mean, I'm just... I, I, mm -hmm. I'm actually trying to say, suggest that, effectively, it's about making sure that people, whether they be uh, young girls or from ethnic minority backgrounds or 
uh, disabled, there, there's a role for you, there's a, there's a career for you, in the, and there's an opportunity for you in these industries. Uh, that's where the core problem is. Um, and I'm wondering about the, the means at which, which you're, you're describing to tackle the core problem. Does, that, that, does the description you've given of, a, of a, a mechanism to try and help actually deal with the core problem of getting more young girls, in this case, to apply? I think it's a, it's a long game we're having to play here, but I go back to what I said earlier. We're work, doing work in primary schools, so you're trying to inspire everyone that there is a and, and give them a feeling that there is a career for them in this industry if they want it. It comes down to choice at the end. The industry is not saying we only want boys, um, but there is a it's a history of it being a male industry and we've got to break that down so we have to go into primary schools do the work there do the work as s1 and s2 pupils to make sure when we get to doing the selections the kids are doing the selections for the foundation apprenticeships that everybody wants to Absolutely. do it and i would agree with that i think that's that, that's directly the point i was trying to raise um james thank you convener uh, i congratulate like you, Graham, and at least trying to break down some barriers, which must be very difficult under uh, existing circumstances. Uh, I want to ask a couple of questions about apprenticeships. Could you, I get the feedback on the main reason or motivations employers have for taking on apprenticeships, particularly young people aged 16 to 19 year old, and conversely, the main reason why they might decide not to? Um, well, the main reason um, our employers would, would take on apprentices is because they see the benefit, and many of them have actually been apprentices themselves, so they've gone right through the system, um, and they can see how it's helped them um, in their career. Um, so it's very much personal experience, and they can see the benefit an apprentice can bring to the organisation. You've got them for four years uh, working for you, so you've got time to shape them uh, in the way you want in terms of your company's values and culture. Um, and usually the apprentices will stay with that employer, so the retention uh, is, is, a, is, is not so much of an issue once they've gone through their full training. The employer will, where possible, keep that young person on. Um, and then they can see the career progression through the company, perhaps into management positions as well. So they see that, that journey of the individual right the way through. Um, some of the, the barriers, well, through the recession, I think some of the barriers was the lack of work that was available, and Graham touched on that earlier. Um, you know, how can you make a commitment for four years to someone when your order book's only sort of three to six months? And that was a very real issue. Um, and we did see a number of apprentices who were made redundant and we had to work quite hard to make sure they were, they were rehomed. That, thankfully, is, is less of an issue now. So I think that particular barrier is, is much less than it would have been, you know, two, three years ago. Um, and I think, overall, the employers see the advantages of it um, as, a, as against the, the disadvantages. They get a lot of support from, from bodies like uh, Scottish Building Apprenticeship Training Council, Scottish Painting and Decorating Apprenticeship Training Council that set the wage rates. They get a lot of support from CITB. There's a very strong structured training programme there. Um, so from an employer's point of view, there's, there's less of a risk to doing that because there's a clear support mechanism for that young person, including welfare, all the way through their apprenticeship. Paul? I think some of the, the positives, first of all, um, we've already touched upon the, the culture within the <coughs> construction industry to continue to recruit and employ apprentices. Apprentices bring uh, a, a degree of energy, a degree of invigoration to their, to their employer. And the employers are also concerned with succession planning. We mentioned earlier that 30% of the workforce are aged 50 or over. Uh, employers recognise that if they, they don't address that problem themselves by recruiting apprentices, they can't expect other people to do it for them. Um, in terms of some of the reasons why employers might be a little bit hesitant to take on an apprentice. Um, I think cost is a major factor there. Uh, the aggregate wage cost to take on a construction apprentice across the four years of the programme is just north of £50,000. So it's a significant investment from particularly small uh, employers. Um, there's also the off-the-job uh, training element, so in your, your average construction apprenticeship, you would lose the candidate for around about 32 weeks as they go to, to college. You need to be able to plug those gaps with other resources whilst the, the apprentice is, is engaging in off-the-job training. Uh, and lastly, I would mention the, the pipeline of work. It is a four-year apprenticeship, so employers have got to be confident that they have uh, a substantial pipeline of work for the four-year duration, which is going to be able to sustain the apprenticeship itself. Okay. 
Barry, Graham. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add on. There's, there's broadly for those who, for the small firms that engage in the programme, it's a cost-effective route to tackle skills deficiencies. You know, Paul aptly summarised all the main benefits. For those who don't, um, the time cost pressures are are particularly onerous. Um, I think looking forward, I think we can we can look to some of the innovations in the apprenticeship pro um, programme and how we can either embark on shared apprenticeships or mixed apprenticeships. Um, so that you can create bespoke apprenticeships, depending on, you know, we'll, I'm sure um, we'll have different opinions on that, but, but how you can allow those who don't have the capacity to take on that apprenticeship over the course of four years could share, um, particularly in industries like tourism, where there is seasonality, you know, they don't have the work um, coming in to cover that workload. So how do you then work with you know, another employer in the central belt who does have that capacity, let's say a large hotelier, to share that skill, say an um, employee across the board. Graham, do you have any comment on this? I was really just following on what Phil was saying. I hope that we've expressed to the committee today that the, the Scottish construction industry has uh, a history of supporting uh, apprenticeships, and, and I don't see that changing in any way. I think what we're going to try and do is increase the numbers that we take on um, and the breadth of people that we employ as apprentices. Um, we can see workload ahead of us, which is strong, uh, and that's encouraging. Um, so I'm encouraged in terms of apprenticeships and the strength in the, in the Scottish construction industry, uh, and I can see us taking on many more in the coming years. Delighted to hear it. But it can can I just move on to the small and micro businesses, which you talked about earlier on? I mean, the question I was going to ask was about how employers might best access the opportunities to take on apprenticeships, particularly among young people leaving school. But earlier on, I think, Barry, it was you that said that many of these companies don't see any value in apprenticeships. How do we break that down? I, I, I would probably say that it's not a case of value. It's just a case of fit. Um, you know, about I'd say around about 66% of our membership um, don't see the relevance of the model for their business. There's this belief um, that still stands that apprenticeships are for hard, hard hat industries only. Um, I think that's very strong in the business community. And, and if you're in the service sector, you know, you, you know if you're in a re if you're a retailer or you work in hospitality, it just wouldn't it wouldn't particularly be the best fit. I think we we see the foundational apprenticeship model as one way in which you can better promote that and, and introduce clear pathways through schools, colleges and into the workplace. Uh, I think that would be the way that you engage early with the employers in a school, make it tangible, make it quite focused, and in the hope that it would have employment benefits. Uh, the, the other part of it is probably around, can we do more to offset some of the costs? You know, if you're a micro business with five employees and you lose one of those for 30 weeks in a college, how, how do you fill that? How do you fill that gap? These are the practical issues that, that our members come to us about and you know they seek support from SDS or others on. And, you know, it's how the logistical elements. It's you know, if we have payroll, how do we cover that? Um, do we get in contractors? Do we get in someone else? And how they fill that how they fill that gap. Well going on from that then, let's talk about those who do want to take on apprenticeships. How best do they access the opportunities to take apprenticeships on, particularly those that are, are going to leave school? Primarily through training providers. Um, it would be you know, the training providers who, who contract out from SDS, who, who access the opportunities. We do less better, I think, of convincing those who are thinking about it but not quite there. Um, but those who, who benefit from the apprenticeship pro programme are you know, evangelists about the programme. There's, there's no question about that. It's those who aren't um, and who, you know, for all intents and purposes, will, will go down a different training route. Um, and we'll embark on something more informal and more work-based. And were they evangelised to the other members of the FSP? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the, the, some of the most powerful change can come about through peers and peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, that, that will achieve much more than any public sector organisation could do because our, our members tend to recruit through word of mouth um, so if you can get apprenticeships working in that model, then you will see an uplift in employment. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any comment? On those? I think it's 
you know, in terms of engagement from small businesses, we have a lot of very strong support from the construction industry, so it's slightly different. I mean, in terms of how we, we recruit, um, young people will apply for a construction apprenticeship uh, through Be Constructive uh, site, which, which we have available for them to do that. Um, and then we have a, a team. We've got 150 staff in Scotland, and most of those work from home, and they're all the way up from Dumfries up to Orkney. Um, and they will work very hard with the employers in their area that have either taken on apprentices, have expressed an interest, or companies that we feel that should be looking at it. Um, and we will trap the door, we will send out information, and we will encourage the employers to give young people an opportunity. And the two main recruitment periods, the main recruitment period for us is around August, September, and we have another intake again in, in January, uh, linking in with the college timetable. But we really do not have an issue with, with employers um, not engaging with taking on apprentices. We've got a strong culture within Scotland of employers who do wish to engage. Okay, can I just ask then... The Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce made the recommendation to focus more on Level 3 apprenticeships, but Audit Scotland suggests that many employers are not seeking Level 3 apprenticeships. What's your comments about that? Are there any solutions to it? Um, in the, the construction industry at the moment, uh, the majority of apprenticeships that we offer are at SVQ Level 3. So what's often referred to as the biblical trades, your bricklaying, joinery, painting and decorating, etc., are all offered at SVQ Level 3. And of the 1,500 or so apprentices that we registered last year, around about 1,100 of those were SVQ Level 3. Uh, at SVQ Level 2 apprenticeships, uh, which in contrast to SVQ Level 3 apprenticeships typically are of two-year duration rather than four, uh, have much shorter off-the-job training I normally don't finish with a, a skills test, uh, as it's known in the industry. Uh, SVQ Level 2 occupations include scaffolding, aims taping, general building operations, um, steeple jacks, a whole vast array of different construction specialisms that could be offered at SVQ Level 2. There is, uh, within SBTC and within the, the construction community, uh, there's quite fierce protection of keeping the qualifications which are offered at SVQ Level 3 at the moment at that level. Um, there's not much in the way of a campaign to dilute those and uh, I'm very much hopeful that that would stay the case. In fact, I would like to see some of the SVQ Level 2 occupations uh, uplifted to an SVQ Level 3 apprenticeship. In a balance of what the industry requires, when so the main, the level three would be the norm, but there are particular parts of the sector which a level three isn't appropriate for, and, and Paul's alluded to that. So that that's when the level two modern apprenticeships would be used. So all of the, the apprenticeship frameworks of construction are developed um, with cons full consultation with the construction industry. So the frameworks that we have in place are reflective of what industry have asked for and require. Um, I think what the the Audit Scotland report did very well was tease out this tension between quantity and quality and so if you know if you have if you have targets you know how feasible is it to to bring in the quality where you know if you speak to skills development scotland a lot of that demand is from level three and below um and you know it's i think it's it's reflecting on you know how we can do both um i think you know how you can change your contributions which sdas are going through just now um to encourage those from level three and above um, at a national level, so you do get that uptake in key sectors. Okay. Okay. Uh, just one last question, then, and it's, it touches on uh, the attainment gap that we've discussed before. The role of the apprenticeship programmes in addressing attaining attainment gap. Where do you, where do you see the role of the apprenticeship programme in that? It's promoting um, a, a career in construction and the apprenticeship offer. To, uh, to all young people in school, so they're aware of what's what's available, um, and I mean, what can sometimes happen is that the least able candidates are, are pushed into a construction or pre-selected into a con uh, career in construction. What we want to do is actually offer the range of construction careers and apprenticeship opportunities available to as wide a selection of young people as possible, so that they can make those educated decisions about what career is right for them. Is there any work done? I mean, let's kind of touches on the, the point that Siobhan was making earlier on, but is there any uh, specific work done that suggests that what you'll do is you'll go to schools that maybe don't have a great record of academic attainment uh, and, and target to try and give some of those kids the better chance of a good lifestyle by recognising the importance of going into construction, for example? 
I mean, we clearly, we, we look at on an area by area basis what the skills requirements are going to be, uh, where the skill shortages are, and then promote the career opportunities in those areas, which are going to lead to sustainable employment, which is at the core of everything that, that, that we do. Uh, and construction is, is slightly unique in the fact that you have to be employed through the full duration of the apprenticeship programme. So they're getting paid from day one and they're employed right the way through their apprenticeship which is a, a fantastic opportunity for a young person. So yes, we would go in um, to, to young people from disadvantaged backgrounds and talk about the opportunities that are available. But uh, we, we would do that for, for all school children. And primarily, you're looking at where promoting where the jobs are and the opportunities are um, in those particular areas based on what work we know is coming through the pipeline over the next four or five years. OK, thanks. And else got any? I think the only point I would add to that is that uh, the construction industry has as a requirement due to the health and safety nature of the, in, uh, of the industry, is that we have regulated competence throughout the industry. So you, you could take someone on who has low achievement at school, but these people are, are developed within the company to get the skills and, and the lifelong learning in some cases to develop the skills they need and the competence they need to operate safely in the industry. So there is, whilst Learning isn't just doesn't finish just at school; it carries on within the employers because the industry demands that uh, through all the different card schemes and competence yeah. schemes yeah. that we have in the industry. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, hey, George. Yeah, just Phil was saying that in certain areas uh, you would probably see what was available work-wise and try and recruit in these areas as well. How do we address a situation like Aberdeen, where in construction there's quite a lot going on uh, at the moment, but maybe a lot of the young people you might need to recruit are probably more likely to be down in the central belt. How do we address that type of situation? Well, I think it's when you're looking at young people within the schools, um, the oil and gas sector is very strong there, and a lot of young people will go into that sector. But I think it's also you know, exploding some of the myths. And we talked about pay earlier. Construction does pay well, and it's competitive compared to other industry sectors. So it's scale of the opportunities. So uh, it's not about saying, well, they're all just going to go into oil and gas. We may as well just try and recruit from other parts of the country. We'll, we'll promote the construction career and the opportunities within that area, uh, first and foremost, to try and encourage young people in. And we would encourage um, clients, when they're procuring work, to advertise through local employment vehicles, to have engagement with the, the DWP, to have engagement with the schools, to get young people in the area engaged around the projects which are happening there. It may be that people have to come from other areas, but we would start from the area we were in, particularly around that in, in Aberdeen, to try and encourage um, enough young people into the opportunities that are available. It's only I'm only asking because I spoke to a. Uh, a construction mm. company that was involved in some of the contracts uh, mm. in that area and their issue is trying to get young recruits because mainly it's mm. either the demography of Aberdeen is either it goes down an academic route <laughs> the young mm. people or they may go oil and gas as well because everybody again it's the parents mm. it's again it's everybody's perception as well but uh, his big issue was he didn't get the flexibility to be able to actually recruit younger yeah. people from down in the central belt to possibly fill that need mm. I think it's a question of balance, but it's certainly um, through what we've talked about, the youth employment strategy, there's an opportunity to have that engagement between the schools, between the colleges, between the employers, between the clients, to try and bring it all together uh, a bit more coherently than has been the case perhaps previously. So I recognise that there is a, there's a real challenge in that particular area, um, but we're, we're keen to try and do what we can to help. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I've just got... One final question. I was just wondering, uh, there's been a trend in recent years for young people to stay on at school longer than there was in the past. Um, certainly when I was at school, quite a lot of people left school at the end of fourth year. That was a perfectly normal thing to do. Most people then left at the end of fifth year and very few stayed on to the end of sixth year. That's no longer the case. It's very different now, the pattern of, of school leaving. Has that change in the, in, in the pattern over, over recent years um, had an impact on the ability of, of your industries to effectively recruit young people in that 16 to 18 year age range? So there, there has been a change uh, in recent years in the profile of the age of the candidates starting an apprenticeship. Uh, and you're right to identify that that uh, entry point has increased. So we, we're finding far more apprenticeships now are or far more apprentices are starting at 18, 19, 20 years of age, having experienced some form of senior school. Uh, one of the things that 
we always try to promote within the construction industry our apprentices aren't just for young people. So the majority of apprenticeships that are offered, uh, almost 9 out of 10 in construction, are for school leavers, be that mm -hmm. 16, 17, 18. But we also have an experienced apprenticeship route, which is available to anybody aged over 22 years. Um, the, the duration of the apprenticeship is reduced from, from four years down to two. It's the same qualification, same college course, but the door remains open regardless of, of a candidate's age in terms of starting out on, on their apprenticeship. Okay. Has, has it had an impact for anybody else? I mean, is there, that traditionally, people went into those many of the construction industries at 16 and learned on the job. Um, we have modern apprenticeships as the modern version of that to a great extent, but... Has that caused any difficulties, the, that, that change in age, age profile? I think that change in age profile may have something to do with the recession that we come through as well, because there may not have been the jobs for these young mm. people at the age of 16, so the option of, you know, going, leaving school and not having a job or staying on at school and trying to get more qualifications, um, that was probably the advice they would be given at that time. Those who can do it would be doing that. I think we're seeing now is that employers realise that we need to try and get these young people and show them that there is a career for them from a young age, but it's a lifelong career and they can go as far in different directions that they want. That's now where we now are as employers. We've got to, I think, go back and, and make that change uh, and try and repair whatever damage was done by the recession at that time. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I thank all of you for taking the time to come and uh, speak to us this morning. Um, it's uh, been a very uh, welcome session and a very interesting session. Uh, I, I think that uh, you know, the more we go into this subject, the, the more um, complex it becomes. Um, uh, that's unsurprising, maybe. But we will carry on again next week. We'll probably have a further session on attainment uh, next week. Um, the committee has agreed to hold the next item in private, and therefore I close the meeting to the public. Thank you.